We'd like to welcome to the show MMA legend John Fitch. Due to technical difficulties, we lost about the first 20 minutes of our interview with him, so we're going to cut into it halfway through. What we talked about in the first 20 minutes, we talked about his retirement, what the decisions he went into this, how he he knew really going into this last fight that it was probably going to be it. He, we talked about his two books, Failing Upwards, Death by Ego, and The Weight Cut Bible. You can find those on Amazon. And some of his podcasts, the John Fitch Knows Nothing podcast, Fitch and Tinkle, um, Smash Everything. You can find those wherever you find your podcasts. And then we're going to jump in where we're talking about the UFC lawsuit that him, Kung Lee, and Nathan Corey launched against the UFC based on their malpractice and how they monopolized themselves to take advantage of the fighters. Let's get into it. Yeah, because we 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 tried to get her on board with, with you know, Ali Act and uh associations because that's what we needed we needed a a standard across the board for all athletes we need an association not not a union a union would be under one promoter and it would give that one promoter a complete control because it would it would uh block the alley act it would block the lawsuit it would it would be a bad situation but that's what she ended up starting pushing to for so like we became very untrusting of, mm. of Leslie Smith. Yeah. You know, why would you push us in a direction towards complete control and dominance of, of one entity? And then, mm. um, but then she got, she got fired for, mm. for steering things up. And I think she just didn't understand the situation because mm. okay. that's, that's exactly what, what, like if you create a one, a one, uh, uh, union entity with the UFC or strike force, then, then, uh, um, <clears throat> that collective bargaining agreement that, that becomes, uh, between those two, like it, it takes away the, the Ali act takes away the lawsuit because they already had that agreement. So they won't need it, but they have no leverage. And she didn't understand the fact that the fighters don't have leverage. Like, Mm-hmm. what are they going to do they're just going to they're going to sit out they're going to they're going to strike they just get replaced like 99 percent of the of the of the of the fighters on this in the stable like don't have that much value and they could just replace them like that and the ones that do have name value they're going to get enough of the money to to say yes sir mm. yeah so like I don't know. I, and I don't understand why people wouldn't understand that. And that's exactly why you can't do a union. Mm-hmm. You need an association that is like SAG or NAFTA, NAFTA, uh, um, the Screen Actors Guild, you know, because that's that's one uh, uh, um, production company. But the an actor can go from to one production mm-hmm. company to another, depending on their contract. So it needs okay. to look more like that. I would love I would love to see. Well, I would love SAG if you're listening. Right, because I'm sure you got a broad reach. Thanks. <laughs> yeah. Listening, they need to expand what they do to include MMA fighters and pro wrestlers. Okay. Qu- count, count us as a, a form of entertainers and, and roll us into what they're already doing. Mm-hmm. That would be really interesting easy, to see. Easy fix, easy mm-hmm. fix for everybody. It would, it would strengthen them, mm-hmm. strengthen okay. us. Everybody wins. Okay. That would be awesome. Yeah, we, we really appreciate the insight into the, the lawsuit. We weren't sure how much we'd be able to get into, but mm-hmm. to go into some of the fighting. So you mentioned AKA before this American Kickbox Academy. Mm-hmm. You're a member of AKA. You're a captain there. And this is one of the most successful gyms in MMA as a whole. You have you, DC, Kane, Rockhold, Khabib all coming out of this gym. What makes it so successful? I think just a lot of uh, hardworking people who... Mm-hmm we able to just push hard without egos. Okay. Because you know, mm-hmm. we had a lot of, we had a lot of big ego guys who came in and were there from the beginning. And that kind of just set a pace with, you know, us being able to work well with each other and, and uh, mm-hmm. you know, new people coming in, being able to stay on that vibe and, and continuing to work hard. Mm-hmm. But yeah, we've, we've had a ton of success. I think the fact that we have a lot of, even though we're the kickbox, American Kickbox Academy, we have a lot of wrestling base. A lot yeah. of guys come from that wrestling base. So we have a lot of guys who are really coachable and we've come from very kind of strict backgrounds on, on uh, training. And uh, that helps a lot, uh, you know, when you surround yourself with other people who are willing to, to push hard and they understand that cardio starts after you're tired. 
Mm-hmm. I think uh, you get a lot of good work done. <clears throat> now, as one of the older members of the previously mentioned group, were you able to take a membership <laughs> role uh, as the captain and help develop other fighters? Uh, well, <clears throat> I was captain after the GSP fight up until mm-hmm. like 2013, 14, because I, I moved to Syracuse, New York for a little while. Okay, yeah, okay. Because I was, I was trying to get something done there. So I moved there for six months, and then I was in Vegas for a couple of years. So uh, DC, DC took over the role. Okay. But yeah, I've, uh, I've always, I'm always teaching. I'm always guys showing guys mm-hmm. uh, different stuff and, and helping out around the, around, the, around the team, around the gym. I'll be getting back in there. I think I need to start uh, grappling again. I'm healed up from the from the last fight. Okay. But um, yeah, you know, I'm I'm open to uh, coaching. I'm actually doing a lot of uh, um, consulting and stuff. So I'll have mm-hmm. guys I can I can talk with and and help them come up with with uh, better strategies on training and and things they're working on. Uh, I have a gym built in my garage. <laughs> So I've had guys, guys come here and work with them. I've had small, I work with small groups and stuff too. So okay, stay, stay pretty active teaching. Mm-hmm. Now, when members of the gym are successful, like DC, when he became the double champ, how much pride does the gym as a whole feel like all of the members to see that happen? It's awesome, man. It's, it's really cool to see everybody uh, doing so well. You mm-hmm. know, you see a lot of guys put in a lot of hard work at the gym. You see a lot of guys goofing around, you know, having, having fun while they're doing it. And it's, mm-hmm. it's cool just to see, to see it happen. You know, mm-hmm. I remember back, like the first really big thing was, was watching Kane win the heavyweight title way back. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That was, that was a different thing. Yeah. That was cool. Mm-hmm. That'd been really cool. Now, as a lot of the old guard from the Academy start to uh, retire and move into other things, who are the up and comers in the gym that you're excited about seeing? Man. <clears throat> uh, Kyle Kirchmer mm-hmm. uh, has has got some promise. He's a, a wrestler from Oklahoma State. Okay. Uh, Dron Wynn, he's, he's been fighting in the UFC. He's mm-hmm. got a lot of potential. Um, <clears throat> uh, man, this is a kid I worked with quite a bit called Kyle Driscoll, who uh, it's like one forty five pounder. Mm-hmm. Okay. But, He's got a long way to go, but he's been he's been doing a lot of good work, and he's been out here for a little while. So mm-hmm. hopefully, we'll see if uh, he needs he needs a couple good ones where he's got to sit down and just bite and throw hard, and we'll see. We'll see mm-hmm. if he's, he's going to awesome. do it. Looking forward to that. Now, as one of the main members now of AKA the the former champion, could be, <clears throat> do you think he's going to come back and fight, or do you think he stays retired? I don't know. I uh, I don't see why he wouldn't just stay retired. I don't know what what fight they're gonna try to set him up with. Mm-hmm. But I mean, it's not like he needs the money. Yeah, yeah. he's an actually he's actually a good guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, <laughs> he's actually you know he's like he doesn't just like pretend to be a Muslim guy. He like actually mm-hmm. does mm-hmm. all the stuff, and uh, he might just be like sick and tired of the, how dirty it is mm-hmm. yeah that's <laughs> like, fair enough that's fair. like some of the people you might have to deal with on a regular basis yeah might not want to deal with anymore he's like i'm just done with it i can mm-hmm. see that i could see that being influence on it do you think if he does come back it would be for the certain fight like the gsp fight that's been mentioned i think that would be something that he would be interested in that's mm-hmm. something mm-hmm. i honestly i think he should uh He's gonna fight this man. Yeah, that that would, that would be a good fight. That would be. I think, I think he should just fight this man. Just do it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> would there be? They had the same manager though. Do you think there would be any conflict because of that? That's it's a huge conflict. Of <laughs> yeah, 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 it's ridiculous. It's rid- thank you for bringing this up. Yeah, I don't mean to be a dick. I like Ali and everything, but this is <laughs> it's it's a byproduct of the corrupt sport. The sport mm-hmm. itself is corrupt. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You, you can't have a promoter controlling title and, and exclusive contracts. Mm-hmm. Like he's, he's going to give the rankings and the title shots to the guys that financially benefit him the most. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It has nothing to do with skill or merit. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So then you get managers who get hired <clears throat> and uh, they get preferential treatment from the, from the promoters 
because they they're just yes men to the promoter. They work really mm-hmm. as brokers for the promoter. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they're not really cutting hard deals for the athletes. And then so you have you have promoters now, or not promoters. You have managers now that have like a hundred, two hundred fifty clients. <laughs> it's it's ridiculous. Yeah, you yeah. know how many you know how many an NFL manager is allowed? No, we're not sure. Three, <laughs> three. Wow, man, that's. That's, that's a, a huge difference. Scale. Yeah, that's a big. Yeah, yeah. yeah because you it, with because Ali, it, it's yeah. a conflict of interest when you have yeah. that many guys. You don't. You're not because you you're supposed to. The manager's supposed to have a fiduciary responsibility to do the best financial thing for his client. Mm-hmm. Yeah, can't do that if you got 200 clients. No, mm. no, no, you can't. That 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 is wild. Yeah, I, I didn't realize that there was such a <laughs> a, a difference between the it's sports. All, it's, because we're not really a sport. We're pro wrestling without mm. the predetermined outcomes. Everything else, mm. everything else you see is run like pro wrestling. Mm. Even the USADA drug program, I believe. Mm-hmm. Fair enough. Now, to get back to, to you a bit here. So you were able to capture the championship and World Series of <clears> Fighting, <throat> defend it twice, once when it was called well, World Series of Fighting, and then with PFL. Well, the well. second time it wasn't a, I did, there was no title. There was no title. What happened? What happened? They changed the, t- the name of the. They changed the name of the company. Did you not? So I was no longer the title champion of that company. Wow. So, so you didn't retain the title with the the name change? I didn't get a PFL belt. No, there was no belt there. I didn't wear one out. They didn't give one to me after. With that, they, made, they were supposed to be a five round fight. Wow. Did that kind of lead into the change for after afterwards you left for Bellator? Was that kind of some of the reason why? It was. I mean, part of it because I'm just not. It's ridiculous. My my goal was to get to somewhere, be a champ, and then fight twice a year for championship mm-hmm. money. Yeah. Not not fight in a tournament against young killers who nobody's ever heard of. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, that's that's fair. That's fair. Like, go ahead. Like if I was just starting out, that's a great way to get your name out there and, and find some uh get some capital for starting your career and set up a good base camp and stuff like that. Great. But like for 35 40 fights deep hmm. i don't know if tournaments are really what you need to be doing yeah that's yeah. very fair unless it was uh if i could if it was all one night mm-hmm. that, would, that would make it be interesting <laughs> yeah just one after I do the that other. For, yeah if i do that for a million because then it's like one training camp at three fights. yeah Good. yeah you know it's efficiency right <laughs> yeah. yeah i'm all about efficiency <laughs> yeah that's, yeah that's get it. awesome yeah, so you've you've fought in multiple organizations, uh, the marquee ones being the UFC, Bellator, and PFL. Uh, which banner did you feel the most at home under? I know you had strife in many of them. So. Well, UFC changed. <clears throat> I mean, I, I Bellator was always great. I love Bellator. It was mm-hmm. fun. The whole time was great. Um, PFL was cool too. It's just I didn't like their management. It was just mm-hmm. screwed up. Mm-hmm. They didn't have their shit together yet, and <laughs> it was frustrating. Um, but UFC was cool at first because they had everybody on, uh, Hey, we're all in this together. This is Mm -hmm. team effort. We're all going to get big. We're all going to be making big money someday. And then, uh, it started to change into like, Mm -hmm. no, we're just do what you're told. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We know what we're doing. You're expendable. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's tough. Did it? Did you like being able to spend time in multiple organizations during your career, or would you have preferred to fit into something like Bellator right away? I think I had a lot of early, a lot of my early fights. Like no one ever had heard of me because I was jumping around from organization to organization. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So I can see the benefits towards uh, signing with a with a with a consistent promoter earlier to get to get more recognition because you're going to get promoted more through that promoter. But mm-hmm. at the same time, the game's kind of changed and promoters in MMA don't really promote because mm-hmm. they yeah. don't have to. Yeah. And because it's kind of a waste of their uh, investment because if they, they promote a guy and they make him popular and he's good, he jumps ship to the bigger, bigger promotion. Mm-hmm. So okay. like, that's always going to happen to him. So there's no reason for a small promotion to promote a guy. <clears throat> Like they'll promote their fights and they'll promote their name, but like why promote the guy? Cause he's just going to go to another organization. Mm. Yeah. Uh, and that happens to everybody up until the UFC and then the UFC uh, is the big show. So 
if you want big fights for them, you better already have a name. Mm -hmm. Right. So like, they're not going to promote you more. So that's why they'll have guys that like, I think it was Corey Anderson. I use this example a few times. I think he had like, he had like 10 wins in the UFC, but he had only like 40,000 followers Mm -hmm. on one of his things. And I just thought like, that's, that's a failure. Uh, Like the promoter is not putting any effort into promoting this guy. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's no way you could get through 10, 10 wins <clears throat> mm-hmm. in that organization and not a million people not know who you, who you are. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because and then yeah, and then even when he left to go to Bellator, Dana White was really disrespectful to him on the way out the door. Pretty much shunned mm-hmm. him that he wasn't a big part of the organization, <clears throat> but he just fought in a number one contenders fight. Yep. So I mean, it's just yeah, they don't. So that's uh, that's one of the other things I'm working on is mm-hmm. uh, I'm. A, I'm working on creating a business entity where I, uh, I help do that promotion for the fighters for them. Mm-hmm. Okay. Cause the promoters are going to do it. Yeah. <laughs> so if I can, yeah. if I can make some money off of doing it for you, because that's the thing now is like with social media, everything, like the promoters, they really do. They expect you to do everything yourself. Mm-hmm. Okay. So yeah. unless there is um, some kind of structural change to the sport of MMA, like that's just the way it's going to be because mm-hmm. they don't, they don't need to they don't need to put money into promoting you yeah okay fair enough now we like to kind of end our interviews with some just some fun questions to, to rattle off here at the end so first off what's your most memorable fight from your career uh the it's a tie between the eric silva and the gsp fight okay is is there a reason why those are your most memorable they were just really big fights and yeah the Eric Silva fight in Brazil and everything around it and the build up to the GSP fight and the title shot and mm-hmm. the uh, documentary, all that stuff. Okay. Now who's the best fighter you faced in your career? GSP. GSP. Yeah. yeah. That's fair. That's fair. Who's the best fighter you've trained with in your career? Man, who have trained with a lot of different guys. I've trained with guys, different weights, you know, mm-hmm. Henderson. <laughs> um, I even I even light sparred with uh, the Rico the Horvin whatever that giant oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, wow I mean like I've so let's see yeah, I've I've sparred with a lot of guys I've mm-hmm. worked out with a lot of guys it's too hard to too hard to yeah that's that's fair that's fair now uh, what's the worst injury you've entered a fight with <laughs> uh, I had a pretty bad like MCL uh, tear when I fought Hendrix. Mm, okay i did like the blood platelet shot thingy in it and Mm -hmm. everything that was yeah Mm -hmm. that's fair don't fight for money guys (laughs) yeah fair enough (laughs) now we know you got the weight cut bible but do you have any weight cutting horror stories times that you didn't know if you're gonna make the scale or not no i think the uh the first time i ever made weight was was horrible and that was like when i was in the seventh grade (laughs) sorry about the dog eighth, eighth grade or something no worries in the eighth grade, I think something like that, and uh, that was bad. But I didn't know what I was doing, and mm-hmm. then I didn't, I didn't cut weight again until until college. And okay. then I had a whole season that was probably just terrible because I wasn't eating good. I would skip food. I would not eat all day, so I had to eat like candy or ice cream at night because <laughs> I was doing like the calorie count. Yeah. Calorie yeah. counting is not. Do not. Yeah, calorie <laughs> counting. Not all calories are equal. Mm-hmm. But uh, no real like horror stories where I. I wasn't going to make it. I've always been mm-hmm. pretty good. And that's, that's one of the reasons why I, I wrote the book. Cause it's mm-hmm. most yeah. of that stuff like uh, is, is pretty consistent. The mm-hmm. diet's the one thing that changed in the later years. And when mm-hmm. the diet changed, it was just like super easy to make weight. Mm-hmm. That's fair. And so, and what, what dietary changes were those? Like, uh, like, like a uh, fight week. No, I don't do any carbs fight week until mm-hmm. after weigh-ins. Okay. Mm-hmm. Good stuff. Where, where, when I first got into the UFC, I was eating like pancakes, you know, like <laughs> Tuesday before. Mm-hmm. Okay. That'll make, big, that'll make a big difference. Um, mm-hmm. Now, going back to the beginning, uh, at what point did you know you could do this professionally? When were you sniffing it? When, so I got started because Tom Erickson, who was a, a he fought in Japan and, and, and pride and fought in Brazil and some stuff. He was a uh, number two in the U S Olympic ladder for, for freestyle wrestling. Mm-hmm. He was my, one of my assistant coaches at Purdue and he would have guys like Mark Coleman and Gary Goodrich and, and, and other people come to town. Ian Freeman came to town once. And 
I would jump into workouts just as something different to do, to lose some weight or to sweat or just whatever. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I was working with like Gary Goodrich and I was like, he was kind of tired and I was taking him down like easily and just handling mm -hmm. him. And then there's afterwards I started talking about money and he was like making like 75 grand a fight. And I was mm -hmm. like, so I can take you down <laughs> like over and over and over again for $75,000. Yeah. Yeah. I could, probably, I could probably submit you through exhaustion. <laughs> I was like, huh? I was like, this, this may be, maybe there's something to this. <clears throat> Cause I had even recently started, you know, adding weight classes and stuff to the fights. And mm -hmm. so I was like, Hmm, maybe. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. Now looking at your career as a whole, what do you think was kind of the pinnacle of your career? Fighting wise, you still Fight, have a lot yeah, of fighting. Wise. Wise. Yeah. <laughs> like, I'm just yeah. getting started, man. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I mean, I don't know. Pinnacle. The, you know, I mean, I think the, uh, I didn't get the decision, but the Roy McDonald fight was, mm -hmm. was pretty epic. I mean, yeah. That would have been the cherry on top, but I, mm -hmm. uh, you know, I think I was, I was, I was kind of retired after that fight. I was happy mm -hmm. with that yeah. being the last, last fight. Mm -hmm. You know, everything yeah. I put into it, I thought that was a great, mm -hmm. that was a great crescendo, great peak to yeah. end mm -hmm. things with. But then, you know, the girls are such a cool opportunity to fight Neiman in the circumstances of an apocalypse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. How how was yeah. that? I mean, your your last fight with no fans. Uh, it was, was weird. It? I yeah. started walking out. I was like, oh yeah, that's right. There's nobody uh -huh. here. Uh huh. Yeah, yeah. it's we, bizarre. Yeah, mm -hmm. bizarre is a great word. I mean, bizarre. just watching it from home, it's weird. So I can't imagine as someone who's had so much experience with the fans and the roaring crowd to come mm -hmm. out for your last time. Um, does it? Cause does even, it? Yeah, because even with small shows, it was like usually some drunk asshole. It's like, yeah. 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 <laughs> do, do, does it kind of feel like you're almost back in the gym sparring like uh not quite it's uh i mean it's it's a television show it's like you're mm -hmm. on a set of like a, a sitcom or something <laughs> yeah you know yeah where's, where's cousin joey <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome man now, now we really appreciate you coming on. Can you can you let our listeners know where they can find you on social media? Go to johnfish.net. You can get everything there. I got mm -hmm. a newsletter you can sign up for. And uh, you can follow the links to all my social media stuff. I got lots going on. A lot of fun fun things happening. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right. We really appreciate this, man. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you, guys. And good luck with the lawsuit. Right, Godspeed, thanks. my brother.